Galaxies and clusters of galaxies, untold billions adorn the cosmos. When the Hubble Space Telescope focused its gigantic eye on a small slice of seemingly empty space, it revealed a breathtaking tapestry of 10,000 galaxies, spirals and ellipticals, specks and smears of light, each of them billions of stars. To me, it's the most riveting photo ever taken. How did such grand, large-scale structure of the universe come about? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. I begin at Princeton with astrophysicist J. Richard Gott, an expert on cosmic structure. I hear he can lay out the entire universe on a single roll of paper. I hope it's a long one. Richard, how can we begin to understand this large-scale structure? We think that the large-scale structure that we see in the universe today was formed starting from small quantum fluctuations in the early universe, and that these have been amplified by the action of gravity over 13.7 billion years. So regions that were a little denser, because gravity is working, they get denser still. I mean, we're talking in the early universe on extremely small scales, microscopic, uh, not visible in, in terms yes, of our Yes, we're, we're talking perception. about these giant clusters of galaxies and filaments of galaxies and things that we see, walls of galaxies, are really um, sort of fossil leftover from the random quantum fluctuations in the universe, maybe 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the beginning. Hmm. That's a, it, it, it's an incomprehensible period of time. What happened during that period of time results in this enormity that we see today. Because the universe has expanded so much. Right. These microscopic right. small things have expanded to very large scales by the, present, by the present day. How can we begin to understand some of the rich detail of this structure? Well, let's look at a map. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, well this is a map of the entire universe. All of it. From the center of the Earth all the way out to the furthest thing that we can see. Okay. So it starts out here with the, the center of the Earth is iron. Uh -huh. And uh, this is the central iron atom. This is the nucleus of, this, of the central iron atom at the center of the Earth. And this is the central neutron in the center of the iron atom. And we can see the three quarks. Actually, so this is just the neutron in the central uh, atom in the center of the Earth. That's right. That's right. Right, right. And so we have a neutron here. We have a proton here, neutrons yeah, yeah. here. We're showing an equatorial slice. Each tick mark over here is a factor of 10 further out. So it's a logarithmic scale. It's a logarithmic scale. And so even though these look different size, these are in fact the same size as the scale changes. Yes, every time the scale, every time the distance goes out by a factor of 10, the scale goes down by a factor of 10. Right. So things that are further away are shown smaller. Mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. allows us to to, to do this. To so, get the whole universe. To get the whole universe. Right. Now we come out here. This is the innermost electron Still cloud. Still in one atom of iron. In one atom of iron. And here's the, here's the outer electrons. And then ah. we can come out and we see, we see the other iron atoms. Uh, and they're in their crystal structure here. And um, now we're one uh, millimeter away from the, uh, from the center of the Earth. Right, here. right. And so we're, we're still in the iron, solid iron core Four. of the Earth. Each one of these is a factor of 10. And finally, we come out. Here's the outer edge of the solid inner core of the Earth. And here's the liquid outer core. Right. And here's the, the mantle. lower mantle and the upper mantle. Mm -hmm. And this is the surface of the Earth uh -huh. at the uh -huh. Earth's equator. And this is showing you a 360-degree panorama mm -hmm. looking out and, and again, this is 10 times the radius of the Earth. We can see here uh, the, all the Earth satellites. There's about 8,000 oh, wow. um, uh, artificial satellites. You can see the International Space Station uh -huh. here. 
Here's the Hubble Space That's Telescope. Correct. These are in very low Earth orbit. And here are GPS satellites that you, <laughs> you mm -hmm. use. And then we come on out here, we get the moon. Mm -hmm. This is about 60 Earth radii away. Mm -hmm. And here's the WMAP satellite. Yep. This has uh, observed the cosmic microwave background radiation from the early universe. Um, we get some near-Earth asteroids here. And here's Mars. And how many Earth radii is well, that? Well, this is getting up to 10, 10 to, to the, the fourth. fourth so. And then we see the sun, Mercury and Venus. Mercury and Venus going around the sun. This is the, this is the asteroid belt, Jupiter and Saturn here. Mm -hmm. uh, and here we have Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. This is Halley's Comet which is uh, currently out here. And these are the uh, Kuiper Belt objects here. These are uh, about 700 of these that we've discovered. And these are icy bodies like, like Pluto. Pluto. Yes. And, and here's our spacecraft, Voyager, Voyager 1 and 2 and Pioneer 10 on the way out of the solar system here. This is, is the heliopause, which is uh, sort of the, the interstellar medium starts here. This is the, where the solar wind sort of ends. Uh, the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud. This is where all the comets come yeah. from. There's lots of comets in the Oort cloud, and uh, these are periodically knocked loose into the inner solar system. This is uh, Alpha Centauri and Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri is the nearest star to us. Four light years away. About four light years away. Um, this is uh, Sirius, which you can see in the northern sky, and Vega. These are quite prominent stars. And then we have here these stars that are circled mm -hmm. are ones that we've actually discovered planets wow. going around. This is Cygnus X1. It's a black hole. This is the center of the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. This has a black hole in it that's about um, uh, 2.6 million solar masses. This is, there's the Crab Nebula. This is a, a supernova remnant mm -hmm. of, um, that was seen by the Chinese about all, a thousand years ago. All in our own ago. galaxy. This is all in our own galaxy. Here's the extent of the Milky Way mm -hmm, here. This mm -hmm. is all in our own galaxy. And again, each of these is a factor of 10. And further we come up here, here's the, the, the large and small Magellanic clouds. These are satellite galaxies to our own. And this is uh, M31. This is the Andromeda Galaxy, which is the other large galaxy in the local group of galaxies. This is M87. This is in, the, in this galaxy, in the center of this galaxy, we've discovered the largest black hole. Wow. This is a uh, uh, three billion solar mass wow. black hole in the yeah. center of this galaxy. And then we start to get galaxies here in the Sloan survey. We have 125,000 galaxies that we've plotted. And we see a lot of structure here as a voids here. Yep. And we start discovering great walls of galaxies. This is a great wall of galaxies discovered by Geller and Hooker called the Great Wall. It's about 750 million light years long. Hmm. And this is a Sloan Great Wall, which is in the Sloan survey that uh, this is, this looks like two thirds the size, but actually it's three times further, further away. away. It's 1.37 yep. billion light years long. It's the largest structure that we found uh, in the universe. How many galaxies would be in this uh, Sloan Great Wall? Well, there's about 10,000 here in, mm -hmm. in this. So, and it has many rich clusters and groups of galaxies mm -hmm. in it. It's an extraordinary structure. And the, you'll notice that there's a sort of sponge-like structure here of these uh, great walls. And uh, this is um, uh, something that you'd predict from inflation. Uh, inflation predicts that these structures are due originally to small random quantum fluctuations. And if the, these are random, you expect the high density and low density regions to look the same. Mm -hmm. And a sponge does that. The insides <laughs> and outsides right. of the sponge are the same. So we have this complicated sponge like pattern of galaxy clustering here. And then finally, here's the cosmic microwave background. It's the furthest thing that we can see. Uh, it's uh, uh, light coming to us, radio waves coming to us from the when the universe was only 380,000 years old. Because before then it was opaque and you... Yes, it's like a fog. You're right. looking into a fog right. bank. So right. it's right. the furthest that you can see. And uh, this is about 13.7 billion light mm. years away. That's how old the universe is. That's mm. how long it's been coming from us. Well, that's very exciting. So this, is, this is the whole universe <laughs> on, uh, on, on one map. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Riveting. What more to say? 
the entire universe rolled out on one sheet of paper. Yes, a long one. How could such wondrous complexity arise? Billions of galaxies, all originating from a sizzling soup of furiously hot plasma, emerging out of the Big Bang and expanding outwards. I go to Iceland for a meeting of the Foundational Questions Institute, FQXI, where physicists and cosmologists dare to dream. I meet astronomer Avi Loeb, originally from Israel, now at Harvard. Avi's an expert on how galaxies formed and evolved. I ask him how we got from the Big Bang soup to the galactic structure we see today. The simple answer to that is gravity. What gravity did is start from these initial conditions and uh, make the universe much more complex. How did it do that? Uh, there were density fluctuations in the universe. The density was uniform by and large, but there were small fluctuations, small differences in density from region to region. And if you consider a region that was slightly more dense than the mean density of the universe, this region acted upon itself by its own gravity and made itself even more dense with time. So in fact, instead of expanding with the rest of the universe forever, it drew matter into this region so that eventually the region collapsed upon itself and did not participate in the cosmic expansion. And that's how an object was made out of such a region. And the universe was filled with small density in homogeneities that resulted from inflation due to uh, fluctuations, quantum mechanical fluctuations. So it's these inhomogeneities, these small fluctuations caused by quantum fluctuations that later emerged through gravity over time into the structures that we see in the universe. That's correct. These were the seeds that were implanted by inflation that later grew to become the objects that we see nowadays, just like the seeds of a tree that are smaller than the tree itself. Uh, and they were small, and gravity made them bigger with time. Now, you may ask, when did the first objects appear in the universe? So inflation uh, ended around 10 to the minus 35 seconds. And after that, there was a long period of time during which radiation was the dominant constituent in the universe. And during that time, no objects could be made because the radiation would suppress the formation of objects. And it was very opaque. You couldn't see anything because the radiation was just bouncing off everything. That's correct. And then about 400,000 years after the Big Bang, uh, the gas, due to the cosmic expansion, the gas was able to cool to a point where hydrogen atoms formed out of it. Okay. And because of that, the radiation was able to stream freely through the gas and decouple from it. And then the gas was able to condense into objects after that. And it took some time before the first objects appeared. According to theory, the first objects appeared when the universe was about 100, 100 million years old. And then um, the first stars formed inside these condensations of gas and dark matter, and they produced radiation that in principle we can see. Now, from that first object, how long did it take to have the first star? Because you needed a critical mass so that it would implode on itself and you'd have enough uh, 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 heat and pressure to cause a, a, a fusion reactions uh, right. among hydrogen to create the thermonuclear activity. That process was very quick, about a million years. And as time went on, because of the unstable nature of gravity, the small inhomogeneities grew and became eventually collapsed into making objects. They first collapsed into sheets, and when the sheets intersected, they made filaments, and then material from the filaments uh, was channeled into the intersection of the filaments and made 
uh, galaxies and eventually groups of galaxies. Gravity, operating alone, slowly but inexorably, working its wonders, coalescing innumerable atoms, floating and flowing randomly into the magnificent large-scale structure we see today. It seems incredible that something so simple, gravity, can generate something so complex, life. But is this just a story? Is there any real evidence? I'm told about a baby picture of the early universe. I go to Berkeley to meet the man responsible, George Smoot, for taking that picture won the Nobel Prize. George, what is the picture of the early universe that can give hints of what this, these huge structures would become? So with the cosmic microwave background, we make the picture of the embryo universe. And what it shows us is the universe itself is extremely homogeneous and expanding very uniformly in all directions. But there are all these small variations at the part in 10,000 level. And those variations are there present with average variation equal on all scales. It's completely scale invariant at the beginning. That is, if I look on the scale of the horizon, that is, as far as I can see in all direction, I see a, a large scale variation across that, and its average variation is about a part in 10,000. And if I look at, say, a third of the way across the horizon, I see the same sort of variations, just random fluctuations. And if I look down to tiny scales, I see the same thing. And so... And this is across the whole sky. I this mean, is across the whole sky. When you do sky, the cosmic microwave back yeah. radiation, it's, it's, right. it's everywhere. And what we're basically seeing is you know, looking out and seeing the surface of a sphere that's 14 billion light years away from us, and we can imagine that any samples of surface of spheres have roughly the same appearance. It's just random variations that we see stars in. And we, so we can make up this map, we can do computer simulations, and we see this evolution. And the thing that has happened is the things that are really big, the matter hasn't had time to move around, so they're pretty much primordial and they haven't formed their large scale structure. But when you get down to the scale size of the Great Wall and then the you know, clusters of clusters of galaxies, they're the biggest things that will form because now we shut off the formation of structure by the re accelerating expansion of the universe. But what's particularly remarkable is that you can, you can uh, forecast all of this from right. the early universe, from the picture of the early universe. That's right, you can start with this very simple case, basically a homogeneous soup, it's like a glass of water with just a few specks in it. And those are going to grow kind of like mold, or except, it's, <laughs> except it's by gravitational right. absorption. You can do those calculations. You just need Newtonian gravity or Einstein gravity. It's simple. But you just start and you just let 14 billion years go by and gravity pulling it in. And eventually, you'll find this, what we call the cosmic web, this, this structure where there are these large, like dirty cobwebs of galaxies. You know, they're, they're beautiful. They're, nice shining lights in the sky that are just, you know, take your breath away when you look at it. So, you know, I look at that picture and I see millions of galaxies in that picture and I go, you know, wow. Yeah. Every one of those was a quantum fluctuation and it just got expanded by the expansion of the universe to be this scale. And then all you had to do was cook it for, you know, <laughs> sort of let it cool on the stove, to say, so to say, for the 14 billion years. And then you got these beautiful it's jewels. Started. We know where it is. I am in awe of what we humans have discovered. Almost 14 billion years after the Big Bang, we can see, literally see, its afterglow. The Nobel Committee called observing the cosmic microwave background radiation the starting point for cosmology as a precision science. That's the real evidence for the early history of the universe. Now what about the future of the universe, its ultimate fate? I go to Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory to meet the man responsible for one of the biggest shocks in scientific history. 
Saul Perlmutter. Everyone had expected that, due to gravity, the expansion of the universe would be slowing down. Saul discovered that the expansion of the universe was speeding up. I asked Saul about dark energy, the mysterious force that powers, apparently, the accelerating expansion of the universe. Some of the data that you've remarkably uh, uh, observed and developed, particularly as it affects dark energy, h how does that affect this large-scale structure? It actually turns out to make a big difference because if you live in a universe where it's always slowing uh, down in its expansion, it in some sense makes it easier to form structure because things can, can be attracted in and fall in towards each other more easily. If you live in a universe, as apparently we do, which has started to accelerate and expand faster and faster, in some sense now you're trying to you know, run down <laughs> an, an up escalator. Um, it's a, there, there's you know, something that's trying to pull things apart at the same time that you're trying to congregate galaxies and clusters of galaxies, and, and that changes that whole picture of how the structure forms. So you need dark energy. You actually need some extra push to make the universe get a little bigger at the very end, um, or you won't see what we see today. Now, is it fair to say that the dark energy at the very beginning, uh, after the cosmic microwave background picture, had very little impact because it was much smaller, but over time it, it, it's growing in its impact, so it didn't, it didn't affect very much the early structure? Precisely. And in fact, if dark energy had been a much more important you know, part of the universe in the early days, um, you would have ended up not, you would have had a very different world than we see around us. It would have expanded things you know, so much that nothing could have clustered um, and we would not have the galaxies and clusters of galaxies and, and us um, that, we see, that we see today. Yeah, so we, we, uh, we like the dark energy in a sense to make things the way they are today, but if it started too soon or too strong, it, it would have... Precisely. Th th there'd, be nothing, there'd be nothing here. It, w w what is the time frame? Uh, Typically, uh, in, in, in the current picture, um, you would have the matter um, and this gravity slowing the expansion for the first half of the universe, the first you know, seven billion years approximately. Right. And the most recent seven billion years, um, it became so dilute that the dark energy took over and started to accelerate the expansion. So its real, it, its strong effect is after it starts to kick in. Well, and then it stops, uh, it, it sort of slows the clustering down. But during that same time period, while our, while our sun and earth and solar system were forming, it was having an effect on how clustering was happening of large scale things in the universe, like clusters of galaxies. Is it possible to dig beneath what this dark energy may be? And so as our theories develop, is it possible that whatever is causing that might be more complex than we realize? And as we tease apart the elements, it could lead to a, a, an even greater understanding of how the large scale structure developed. Oh, I mean, absolutely. And I, and I should mention that um, when we say dark energy, that's sort of almost loading the question, it almost makes it sound as if we know that the answer to what's causing the acceleration is a energy pervading all of space. Um, it's po perfectly possible that what we'll find is that we just don't have a quite sophisticated enough uh, equation or theory of gravity. And that would be a huge discovery if it turns out that, uh, that if we can slightly modify um, Einstein's theory of general relativity and explain this acceleration, uh, it may allow us to explain many other things that we otherwise will never get to. Throughout history, humans have pondered cosmology, the origins and ends of the universe, immense questions traditionally commandeered by religion and philosophy. One of the magnificent achievements of science is the transformation of cosmology into a precision science. The discoveries are astounding. The cosmic microwave background radiation, providing a baby picture of the early universe. Dark energy, its increasingly strong repulsive force expanding the universe and determining its fate. Quantum fluctuations, buried deep within the universe's first micro, 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 microsecond, providing all the seeds for all the billions of galaxies, which are required, of course, for human life. 
All this is awesome. But whether all this is also necessary, accidental, or providential, it is certainly closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com. <laughs>